Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. Um, this is your King Ginger. Um, this is Down in Outlands. Not a sequel, not a prequel, but tangentially related to um, our lovely player's previous campaign, Domains of Dread. We are live on Heel Turn Radio. Um, please, everyone, introduce thyselves as well as your character, please. All right, I am Nate, your D&D ringer. I am playing Adderkin Rogue, Twig, Swiss Strike. I'm Warrior. I'm playing Null Fighter, Echo. I am Shannon, a.k.a. Smarky Batch, and I am playing Charity Momart. I am Cassandra. I am playing Amulet Sticky Fingers. She is a Kender Barbarian. In this economy. <laughs> <laughs> so to set the scene for those who did not catch the teaser trailer or the end of the previous campaign, um, your characters are all relatively young. Can you give everyone an idea of your ages, please? I'm 10. I'm also 12. 10. And I'm well, I'm, well, I'm 10. Oh, you're the oldest. Yeah, that's right. So all of you were living your lives. Um, Echo on... Um, Gosh darn it, now I can't remember the name of that world. Exandria. Uh, Exandria. Amulet on Kryn. Charity on... Stormsong. Stormsong. I almost called the Stormguard. <laughs> and then Twig was on Mistara. Um, each of you somehow found yourselves approached by agents of the Neogai. The Ogai are an ancient, mysterious race who ply the byways of the multiverse, mainly known for their proficiency in slave trade and war between planes. For some reason, you four were plucked from your homes. You're not sure why. And really, it sounds like most of you, it was not a terrible kidnapping <laughs> um i know at least two of you were like oh yeah sure what, what's going on <laughs> um so you are brought aboard a eventually aboard a very striking spider-like vessel and given food and drink with a myriad of other individuals and eventually you drifted off to sleep you're not sure how long you were asleep, but it was some time. And while asleep, all of you dreamed. I would like each and every one of you to make me a history check. Better the roll, the more you'll remember. Oh, man. It's gonna be a ten. <laughs> Starting up things strong. Yeah, we're we're getting it, we're getting it going real good. Sterols are to play. That's a eleven. It was a twelve, but now it's an eleven. Fourteen venture. <laughs> Starting off great. I rolled a nineteen, so I got a dirty twenty. Oh, look well, at you. I'm rolling like I roll. I got a seven. <laughs> it's lucky. So we'll start. We'll we'll go from low to high. <laughs> So Twig, you dreamt of your home and you dreamt of the streams and the lakes within um, the rough and tumble area of the, of the coast. And you felt things pull out in a way as if you were flying. And then you could see Mistara, all of it. And before you know it, you could see the entirety of 
its crystal sphere. And the thing that really strikes you, the thing that kind of hits home, is you could see the ley lines of Mystara. And they look really familiar to you, like you've seen them or heard about them before. But then you thought a lot about, you know, breaking shells on your tummy and rolling around in the water. And you're like, hey, this is pretty sweet. Time to dream. Charity. Um, you uh, had the song of Storm Song in your heart through the entirety of your of your rest. You could hear the distant thunder, but also the beautiful song of your friendships and relationships with others that you knew and know well. While this goes on, you find yourself being pulled further and further away, but the song stays strong. It's just now just a lost within the distant rumble of thunder. As your eyes close, even within your dream, you can see all the places you know across that area of storm song. And again, there's a, there's a pattern there. And the further you feel that you're pulled away from your home, the further you drift away within your dream, the more the pattern reverberates, the more it is still there, but larger, more disjointed, and you see yourself moving outside of the crystal sphere that makes up your world. You're blinded by the beauty of the stars, and you sleep, echoing in your head the last conversation you had with your best friend, also tinged with this repeating points of light that seem seem very familiar to you. Akko, you dream of the rolling marshes and of the footprints left by your home, of the smell of the hunt and the jingle jangle of your shirt. You Feel the presence of your friend ever present, but you can't hear him. You're just, you know he's there, but you can't really place what's happening. In fact, you can see him there, but you can't really catch what they're trying to express to you. As you're moving, you do tend to notice that the footprints, they're not like a normal footprints of your tortoise city. Instead, they seem to stagger and move and constantly and consistently make a very strange pattern in the mud. It's something that seems very familiar. As you follow, the footprints stop. You move deeper within a jungle, deeper up a cavern wall, You continue to climb and the world gets smaller and smaller and smaller behind you. And then you realize you're no longer climbing, but you're moving up through the air. You smell scents that you've never have smelled before. Different animals, different people, different places. And as you take one last look down, see that pattern again and it seems overly familiar but you just can't place it and then as you start to climb again you realize the hunt is on and in your mind you scamper off to hunt the unknown Amulet you and your family have just left another small village but it's good because, I mean, at least in this village, you found your last name. I mean, 
before you just were in the light, but I mean, everyone called you guys Stinky Fingers, so you just figured, you know, that must be my last name, so that's great. Also, man, I got some really stuff, some really sweet stuff in my jacket that I borrowed from people they'll never miss. Um, as you lean against your mother's shoulder in the back of the wagon that you procured um, outside of the cobbler, who won't miss the pony or the wagon, I mean, come on, who needs it? three ponies and two wagons nobody needs that um in fact you'll give it back to him sometime i mean you'll leave it somewhere for him to find and he'll find it because you know that's how borrowing works you start to drift off and you realize that that never happened you never left with your parents this is a dream your brain is processing this and you're looking around and you're like, am I awake? Am I asleep? But I'm having a dream. And you feel a burning sensation. And you know where it is because you've felt it slightly before, but never like this. You can feel your birthmark tingling. And it's not an unpleasant burning, it's just this heat this genu generalized feeling of power coursing through that. While you're doing, while you're trying to kind of become comfortable with this, you feel yourself floating and then flying. And you look down at Kryn and all of its cataclysm inspired damage to the surface of the planet all of the throes of war that it has been through and you can't help but feel maybe you've borrowed something that you've always wanted and that is the ability to fly but again you're lucid and you realize you're you're not controlling this and while it's pleasant you can't help but feel somewhat claustrophobic. And that's when you look down and you realize your feet are covered. Hey, those look like really nice boots. They're mine now, they're on my feet, they fit, that's pretty cool. But the more you look down, the more that these boots, you start to realize your brain is kind of a fog, is that it's spindling thread. And it's working its way up your legs. And you try to turn around and fly away. You find yourself flying high above Kryn, trying to fly back to it. You look over your shoulder and you see something in the shadows that looks like a spider wrapping you in a web. The last thing that it wraps are your eyes. And your eyes open and you realize you're awake. And you can see the crystal sphere of Kryn's face. And you realize there's no way to fly home. You're not sure how, all, how long all four of you slept. You have very deep, pleasant dreams, but it feels like you've slept for a really, really long time. Eventually, you do wake. And upon waking, you find yourself coughing, sputtering, as something is pu literally pulling the threads of a cocoon off of you. And when it does this, the threads start to evaporate as if they were being consumed. You each in turn look up and you see what looks like a broken, battered set of plate armor, blackened, holes in it, 
a weapon on the back that is shattered on one end, a battle axe with only one end that's functional. Within the holes, you can see a lime green undulating form. And you realize that one of the hands, one of the gauntlets is actually not there and that there's a pseudopod sticking out of it that's pulling these threads off of you and it looks to be ingesting them in its gelatinous form. At this point, you hear a very, very garbled voice say, Hello, my name is Bush of Earth of Shop. You are awake, small ones. Welcome to your home. What are you? You sound like me. <laughs> I am Bush, Bush of Earth of Shop. I assisted in your liberation. And I've brought you to a new home. You can notice that when Bosch of Uth of Shoth speaks, that a strange glowing ball moves to the center mass where the hole in the armor is. It seems to pulse with a soft purple light. How far is he from us? Um, he was literally extremely close because he was using his pseudopod to just basically eat the cocoons off of you. She's like saying absolutely nothing, but she's just and like she wants she want want to touch want to touch glowy ball. You can attempt to touch glowy ball if you. She want. Going, she wants to attempt to touch glowy ball. Go right ahead. Okay. Proceed to touch glowy ball. Touch glowy ball. Bad things will happen, I'm sure. Oh God, you're gonna die. I'm get, please don't kill me. I'm That's it. Zero. First episode. I mean, I, I no, please. <laughs> What'd you get? Like, so you reach into the touch, glowy ball. Okay. So okay. you are fascinated by this glow. <laughs> you reach into touch glowiness. Uh huh. And upon doing so, you feel this tingle move through your finger. Neat. Um, but you can't seem to touch the glowy ball because it seems to pull back an alarm. And you do hear Boosh of Uth of Shoth make a strange sound, which could be interpreted as a giggle. <laughs> The third is key to touch the booth, push of off of shot. So she kind of like pulls her finger back and then like goes goes back and then back again. <laughs> She's just like, what what you are get a wet pseudopod pat on the head like a parent would give a small child. <laughs> Gross. And then it kneels down on one of its armored knees, looks at you, and the helm is just Pretty much, there's just green glow behind it. Blah, blah, blah. At that yeah. time, you hear the clank of wooden metal on the stone. And walking in through the door is a very lithe and tall looking warforged. Not sure any of you would know. Yeah. Charity, you know what a Warforged is. Akko, are you familiar with a war, what Warforged are? Okay. Amulet would not, and neither would Twig. It looks like some type of golem or construct. So as that occurs, Boosh stands up, and the, the Warforged is adorned in a black and white dress. Almost looks very school marmish. 
And she comes in and she walks past you, puts her hands behind her back with a slight clang of metal on metal. And she says, this won't do, this won't do at all. She goes up to Akko and she pulls her finger apart and it's a long, like a tape measure. And she moves around you and she begins to measure you and jotting down on a pad her measurements. And she does that in kind to everybody. Just children, children, children. I will have your uniforms brought to you. And then you will come and meet your uncle during dinner. She raises her hand like she's in school. Yes. Okay, so I have a lot of questions because like I've seen one of you, but not really seen one of you. Like the one that I've seen is in a museum and that's kind of weird. So I don't really know how old you are, but I'm going to assume that you're pretty damn old, but I don't really know. So ooh, I probably shouldn't say damn, huh? That's probably really bad of me. Atticus told me I'm not supposed to use bad words, but I have a lot of questions. Um, who are you? Uh, that is an excellent question. I will be your teacher. I will be your friend. I will be someone who is always here for you. But you, you can refer to me as Miss Broom. Okay, are you old? Are you like really old? Because like the last Warforge I saw is in a museum and I kind of like go there all the time and he's super old. I am very old and I've been in the open house for quite some time and I've known your uncle for as long as I remember, or even as I, as I wish to recall remembering. Wait, who's uncle? You four's uncle. Wait, we have the same uncle? Uh, we're not related. But maybe but, we are. How cool would that be? That, that's kind of cool. Related. But you are related. You just don't know it yet. So, please clean yourselves up. Do not pester Mr. Boosh of Uth of Shop. See, we'll be leaving soon. And she turns and looks at him and he kind of stands on one foot and can see him kind of his pseudopod moving around the gauntlet that's on his other hand, kind of like, sorry. Um, and understand he means you no harm. He is your friend, but he's also not used to young people. So clean yourselves, make yourselves welcome in this room. And what you realize is this is a large, um, open spaced dormitory. You have rooms, but currently they're just curtained off. They're not, there's no like hard wall. Um, you do have a foot locker in front of your beds. And currently, the beds all look the same. They're very nice. Um, they look like they've all been recently cleaned. You look a little deeper and you see that there's some dust in some areas as if this is set for some time. She says, are there other questions that I can quickly answer before I start your uniforms? Um, I feel like I'm pretty clean already. Well, she looks you up and down, Twig, and she says, I would advise at least some time to continue to get the remainder of the experience off of you. Well, Mr. Boosh of Uth of Shaft can remove almost all of the Neogai threading. Sometimes I find that folks have a small bit of problem coming out of the experience. I mean, it, it, it is kind of weird and stuff. It is extremely weird, my friend. She waves her hand over, and there are a set of different. Um, bathrooms, like entrances, one 
actually three of them. One clearly marked in what looks to be some type of male form. One clearly marked in what looks to be some type of female form. And then a third that has just got a sign over it. <laughs> You're not sure what that means, but it's just another bathroom. Um, <laughs> so she says, you have options here and feel free to use them. I will expect you downstairs. And she reaches into a pouch and pulls out a hourglass and she turns it over. Inside the hourglass, rather than sand, you can see tiny, tiny, tiny particles and they're scrambling around and moving. Make me a perception check, please. Eighteen. That's gonna be a nine. <laughs> Charity, you're like you're a robot. That's pretty sweet. That's awesome. I love robots. Three. <laughs> Echoes like so many smells. <laughs> so many smells. <laughs> I rolled. Right? I rolled my second nineteen, so I got a twenty-one. Okay, I'm on a roll. Overachiever. You're like, oh, wow. There's a lot of stuff that's not nailed, nailed down here. Let me look at all of it. All of it. I um, mean. So Amulet and Twig. <clears throat> what did you get again, Twig? Remind me, please. 18. 18. You both catch this glimpse out of the corner of your eye, and you move closer to the hourglass. Um, upon doing so, you notice that these are not grains of sand that are falling. They're tiny, round six-legged metal bodies and they're scurrying around inside and they drop and you look and on the inside of the hourglass there is a magnet that is slowly pulling them down whoa that's weird it's yeah weird. I've never seen anything quite like that no yeah I'm... you know i've never seen three bathrooms in one place though too it's true so they're like they're like woo science and charity's like already like racing for the bathroom with both arms up like big time woo so you have about 30 minutes what would you four like to do in that time period oh the one thing that does happen when miss Burm leaves is boosh of uth of shoth is still standing there and he kind of as well as you can tell he turns his massive metal head he's big i mean he's definitely like about nine feet tall and he kind of looks at all of you and again he has this aura like he's not around children ever and he says if you would like to learn the wonders of shelf you can come and speak to me and i will tell you of the mysteries of the universe <laughs> having great transformation you can make from your form to earth of shock and then he pulls out of his satchel a book and leaves it on the table is, is there a stream nearby are you talking to um bush of uth of shaf yeah because he's the only one that would know he kind of looks around and his one giant mailed hand points at himself like, are you talking to me? Yeah. Bathrooms. <laughs> kind of like, okay. This is bow. And he clanks his way out of the room. But he left that book? He did leave that book. All right. I pick it up. Dope. Okay, you look at the book. It says the wonders and glory of the great Shaw. All right, I'll put it in my bag. Ooh. Excellent. Um, the rest of you, what are you going to be doing? Do you want to get cleaned up? Uh, you want Echo, to the bathroom? Yeah, Echo is going to start wandering toward the veil designated bathroom. And then yep. he's going to suddenly make a sharp turn and go into the mysteriously marked bathroom. Mystery bathroom. Ambiguously marked. Oh, uh, <laughs> the, the sign that he bathroom. can't interpret. He's like, this is probably the one. Um, so you go in and there are stalls. There's two of them. 
there are sinks, which I don't know how much Echo is used to all of this. Wouldn't be used to it at all. So they look like little compartments about the size of a person. And they've got some type of very fancy bucket that looks to be built into the floor. Um, there's also like a small <laughs> wash basin hooked into the wall and there is a large brass tube coming out of it with a handle. One side of the handle is marked H, the other is marked C. Also in this room, there is a large circular pool of water. Um, it's probably about four feet deep and it's about five foot in diameter. And there is a soft steam coming off of the water indicating that it is definitely warm. Hanging on the wall, there are what looks to be robes, um, but they look big, like bigger than you, <laughs> as well as what you interpret to be some type of very well-kept rag, possibly for drying off. But these look like brand new rags. I go, he's gonna go sniff the bucket. Um, yeah, you sniff the bucket and you're like, and there's the vague background smell of feces and urine, but it is mainly covered by a smell of um, flowers, heavily. But your keen nose kind of digs past that and you're like, this is a place where people go poopy potty. No, clean. Here. It's very clean. Like you're like, usually we just take care of our business out in the wilderness. This is a weird thing that two-legged beings must use. You will go over to the weird wash basin and kind of poke it, the handle with the H on it. Water, clear water starts to come out of it. And then the water, you can tell it's changing temperature because there's steam coming off of it. Push the other one. Push it the other way. Mm -hmm. The steam starts to go away and you get a whiff of like crystal clean. Um, it smells almost like stream water. I'm gonna drink the water. It's pretty good. As far as mm. water goes, it's 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 a mm. solid. Good. Yeah, and leave it running, and um, he'll get into the tub. He'll take his take his chain shirt off. Okay. Get into the tub. The tub is really warm, um, mm. but but not terrible. I mean, it's it's when you get in, you feel very relaxed, and you look, <laughs> and tiny little bits of thread start to come off of your hair. You look across the tub area and there's a little basin and it's got a very interesting smelling bar in it. Oh, soap. Because I've washing out. soap before. Yeah. It's clean. <laughs> it's clean, no. It's clean. Different soap. It's soap right. smells different. Yes, it definitely does. It's a very, very soft. Nice. It is very nice. Clean. You feel clean. What are the rest of you doing while Akko immediately goes in and gets cleaned up? I mean, Amulet will go run to the other bathroom. She doesn't care if it's for boys or anyone else. She'll be like, I can't remember the last time I took a bath inside. Wait, if she goes into the one that's marked for boys, like Charity's racing out there. If she goes running, Charity's like, yeah, girl, gender is a construct. Woo! And just, <laughs> she'll go to the one right next to it. <laughs> so you pop the opposite bathrooms, twig your left going, what? Where's mine? So um, the bathrooms look, you know, I'm not going to restate what they look like, but they all look the same. I'll go in and take a bath, but I'm going to take the soap when I leave. <laughs> okay. 
solid. <laughs> a charity hat. I might need it later. <laughs> charity hat like always has random crap in her apron. Like that's a thing. Uh, somewhere in there, there's got to be something close to a bath bomb that she's tried to cobble together. <laughs> probably, it probably ain't gonna work real good, but she's gonna chuck one of those bad boys right in. Um, and... remind me, do you have some type of inventive skill? Ah, uh, she is... that was one of the things that we came up with. Yeah, she's she's got a little bit of inventive skill. She's 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 not real great at it. That's the thing. Make me a roll. Let's find out what this bath bomb does. Sweet. Uh, that's a four. <laughs> it blows so up you, the tub. Yeah, you throw <laughs> this thing that you made into the bath, and it starts to bubble. It starts to foam. And then after about 30 seconds, it erupts into a geyser. And about half the water comes out, and you are soaking wet. <laughs> it's fine I got clean. But there are bubbles in the water now. Yeah. The, this whole room now smells like strawberries. Like, just just all the strawberries. Goes in the other room, like... <laughs> Outside of one of the rooms, you smell strawberries. Oh. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I want to go in that one. I guess I'll go in this one for the furry people. You see Akko um, generously scrubbing himself with some type of bar. Oh, that's a that's a big tub. Um, he'll take off his armor. Cannonball! <laughs> and he just jumps in, because he's tiny. <laughs> Luckily, one thing you've noticed is all these rooms have a slightly sloped uh, floor and have some type of what looks to be a grate in the bottom. Um, so Amulet, Charity, you both I've gotten cleaned up, uh, and you, you've managed to stick a bar of soap in one of your pockets. Um, uh, Echo Twig also cleaned up. You guys are all going to put your clothes back on. You're going to wear robes. What, what are you going to do? Echo is going to put his clothes back on, and then he's going to put one of the giant robes on over. Perfect. His clothes. Put my clothes on. Like, how much bigger than him is it? He's like seven. Two. So, are you already seven two? I didn't know if you were mm -hmm. that big. Knolls don't like knolls grow really fast. Okay, so it wouldn't be quite that big on you. It would be a little tight, but not terrible. Like hunches over his shoulders, and it's like rip and claw. Well, it seems to be made of something that's a little got a little sturdiness to it. But you are like um, big guy in a small coat. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And like, like the, the end of it is like that hot, much higher than your feet mm -hmm. rather than you think probably a normal person mm -hmm. it's probably going to hit almost the floor but on you it's like yeah. high. And when he gets out of the tub he doesn't use one of the rags he just does that thing like dogs do when they're wet and he's just like <laughs> like shakes off all over everything I'm glad I'm not dry yet Twig, what are, what are you doing? He'll just dry himself off and put on his armor. All right, so all of you, surprisingly enough, come out of your bathrooms at about the same time, and you look over Twig and Amulet, and you notice that your strange hourglasses is coming to a close. All of you can also make me perception checks. Oh, that's a good one. Well. 19. 16. I did not roll good anymore. I rolled a... <laughs> I have a four. Um. So anyone under 10 doesn't notice anything different. I'm going to be in the corner trying to find something to take. <laughs> Up to 15. You notice that there was a few small tables, one of which had the hourglass on it. And then there seemed to be another small table with four chairs that is where um, Bush of Uth of Shaf laid his, his uh, tome. If you rolled up to 15, 
the chairs look like they've been moved. What did you, what did you roll again, high rollers? 16. Okay. 16. Um, you notice that there's actually an extra chair in the room. It wasn't there before. Akko, you are looking at things with your keen senses and you smell something that wasn't in the room before, as well as you have a distinct impression that something's watching you. You sense where? Is no, it? Not, no, not for sure, but you do like, just like Twig, you notice that there's an extra chair in the room. Just gonna try to follow the smell. You follow the smell to one of the chairs. Does it smell like? It smells like polished leather and there is a sourly sweet smell, like probably like wine. You've smelled wine before. From the new chair? Yes. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Smell funny. Chair. Sure. Too many. This looks frustrated. Okay. What are the rest of you going to do? Akko is clearly agitated and is looking at this chair in an odd fashion. Can I flip over the hourglass to the little spider things move down? They do not. That's weird. I'm going to put it in my bag. <laughs> Got a couple of kleptos in this group. I was going to say, this is bad. Good <laughs> lord, you two. It's true. Um, so Twig is going to go over to the chair. Um, so what's wrong with the chair? Mm. Spell different. Hmm. Too, too many chairs. I was just going to sit in the chair. You go to sit down and the chair moves. Fall down? Yes. You land on your behind. <laughs> as soon as you make that noise, the chair changes. It looks... The chair kind of falls into what looks like a pool. And then the pool moves a little further away towards the edge of one of the beds. And then you notice that it looks like um, some type of slime, kind of like Bush of Uth of Shah, but black. And that leathery smell, you all catch a whiff of it now. And it kind of comes into a roughly humanoid shape that's sitting on the edge of the bed. I didn't do it. It is a very skinny, clad in black leather humanoid. He's, well, you can't really tell the gender because it's very feminine face, very masculine form, no nose, black eyes, and a half grin on its face. You notice that there is a set of daggers going down one side and then across the belt. Here you are, Uncle. No, I am not your uncle. Although I'm impressed with with you. What is your name, child? Me? He points to Echo. Oh. Echo. He reaches into one of his pouches. 
and he tosses you something. Catch it. You look down, and it looks very similar to the coins that are on your on your armor. It even has a hole in it, so you can attach it. Oh. Adds it to his shirt. Well done. I mean, I'm impressed. Most, <laughs> most of Tawny's children have nowhere near that type of sense before they come here. No, no, Tawny, child. Who are you? He stands up and with a large, or they stand up with a large flourish. They um, curtsy. I am a non. I sometimes live here, and sometimes I do not. And sometimes Tawny's children are sent to me, and I teach them how not to be seen. That's a little. Mm, is it? Yeah. They come over and they pat your head, and then reach inside and pull the hourglass out of your bag. Hey, that's mine. <laughs> it is not. What is you? he? And then sits down and they say, "What is your name?" Twig. Twig Swift Strike. Twig. May I give you a piece of advice, Twig? Sure. Don't steal from the spoon. Bad idea. Okay, fair enough. They then turn and look at you as well, Amy. <laughs> 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 I would never steal anything. And then they point to where their nose should be. Um, Mistara, it wouldn't be on Mistara. I think you might have them on Exandria, not on Kryn. And I'm not sure about Storm Song. Um, make, um, Charity and Akko make me. Um, give me history check. I'll just call it that. 18. Ten. Echo, you aren't sure what this person is or how it could become a chair. <laughs> um, Charity, this is a changeling. You don't know how it became a chair, but you know by their facial appearance their body language, that that's, that's a changeling. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen one or had interactions, but you've read a lot of books. So. Right. Um, and on then turns and looks at Amulet and says, if I can smell it, so can everyone else. I'll tell you what. You give me that, and I'll give you something in return. Give me what? Child. I have a lot of stuff. I know you have a lot of stuff, because I can hear most of it from far away. <laughs> but I know that you took soap from the other room because I can smell it. Oh, I didn't take it. We're just going to use it later, so I'm holding on to it. Well, I'm going to put it back for you, and I'll give you something in return for it. Okay. Next time you decide to borrow something, talk to Miss Broom first. She's going to let me borrow it? You don't know until you ask. This is your home. Okay. He reaches inside of another pouch, and he pulls out a, he pulls out a pouch. And he tosses it over to you. This is really cool. I have a bunch of pouches, but you can never have too many. This one's slightly special. Can I open it up? You can open it up. It's a small, it's about the size of a dice bag. You open it up and it's bigger on the inside. <gasps> the what? size of whose dice bag? The, that is a good point. <laughs> yeah. Very well said. Inspiration to Twig. <laughs> um, finally, he looks at Charity. 
put my uh, hand they in it. A charity. They they walk around. They grab a, a chair and they sit down in the center of the room. But they look at Charity and they they kind of. You have the look of a learned person. Yeah, I mean, I go to class every single day. I mean, seven days a week. I mean, we kind of sometimes occasionally get Saturdays off, but we don't always. I mean, sometimes. I mean, and sometimes I only have class on Saturdays in the morning. Like, she's just going to keep going if he doesn't stop her. <laughs> you have to talk for about five minutes. Sweet, yeah. She, the she whole time she kind of looks at the rest of you, like, is someone else <laughs> going to do something about this? You. She starts on a school, and, like, by the time you're done, she's talking about club sandwiches. Like... <laughs> he says, hmm... Well, you have a lot to say. I do. Um, I mean, I really like bacon. Have you ever had bacon? It's delicious. It is delicious. Good. <laughs> See? This guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Just let me help you with this. And reaches into a pouch and pulls out a little book. And tosses it to you. Cool. She'll, uh, she'll catch it and kind of like turn it over and... What's all this? The all the pages are blank. Ooh. Rather than speak your stories, don't you think it would be better if everyone could read them? I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, you know what's funny is when Atticus and my teacher said that too. No. I could. And then he reaches, or they reach into their, sorry, they reach into a pocket within their tightly fitted vest. And there is a feather tipped pen and it's floating on their hand by the end. And they look at it and they look at you and they kind of measure it up. They blow it and it literally flies over to you. Sweet. Yeah, she'll she'll take it and she'll uh she'll she'll kind of like grab it and like walk around to like one of the other chairs. Child, like your words, it will never run dry. Cool. That would have been helpful during finals. Twig. Yeah. You really like that hourglass? <laughs> they laugh. I mean, it was, it was, it was weird. Got like little spider things on it. Hmm. And then a pouch. And they toss you what looks like almost like a pocket watch. No chain. Okay, I caught it. Um what's up do? Open it up. And he'll kind of fiddle around with it, hit the button to pop it open. You pop it open and rather than open, it grows six legs, pops down on the ground and walks around you. Okay, um, what's that going to do for me? You could always ask it what it can do for you, but I would recommend one word commands. Stop. It stops walking and it looks up at you with no eyes. Is it one word commands? Mm hmm. Fetch, and I'll point to the hourglass. Please, they have the hourglass, and they, but it, it goes over, kind of crawls up, and tries to take it from him, and he taps it on the top a few times, and then it runs back and runs behind you. So, that's it. And I'll poke the button and turn it back into a watch. Okay. Now that we're acquainted, they sit back in the chair. They look at you and they say, I'm sure you're all wondering where you are, why you are. So I decided to sneak in and give you the primer. You are all wayward souls. Like many, you've been taken from your the home you knew. But you're lucky because 
you've found a home. You find yourself in the city of doors, the very center of all things. It will take some time for you to adjust, to realize infinite possibilities of what is known as the multiverse. Things you, things that were undreamt of to you before lie at your very feet. You're all special. And not just because you found your way here, but because you have found family. Your uncle is a magnanimous, eccentric, and interesting individual. You are not his first children. They smile, almost in a laugh. For the time I've known Connie, I would say you're, they count. 264, 265, 266, and 267. This is opportunity for those of you who wish to learn. You will be given the opportunity to learn anything and everything. And this firm will teach you about Sigil, the city of doors. She'll give you the opportunity to learn, to know the city and to be able to function within it. <sighs> Clax and Vit, you have not met. They will teach those interested how to defend yourselves, how to take life, when to take life, and why to take life. Lady Marma is your teacher. The rest you learn from her, whether it be an interest in spellcraft, the idea of finding some type of purpose in a power, the songs of the songs that actually give you strength, that is her realm. She will teach you what you will need to make it. If by chance you decide you'd like to learn how the streets actually work, how the world really works, then you come to me. Great. Easy. Walk. And then Take I, wagon. Easy. Close, my friend. Then I will have you study with me at the parish. And I will show you the real machinations and gears of society and how to ensure that they always turn in your favor. Eventually, you'll be asked at times to go outside of the open house. Most of the time, you'll be accompanied by Fell. Listen, learn, and let them protect you. That's what they were built for. Other individuals, former sons and daughters of Tani, business partners, well-wishers, sycophants, hangers-on, they all come through the door. Beware honey-laced words. Make a loyalty first to each other and then to your uncle. You should have no problems. And I will see you again before tomorrow is through. Because I have given something to you, and now you will give me, then you will give me something in return.
they lean back on their chair and literally flip out of it, catching the chair on one foot, setting it up and softly kicking it so it goes underneath this table. They move almost like fluid. I think it's time for dinner. Slight grin and just slow saunter out the door. You all stand a little stunned and Anon pokes their head past the doorway again and says, are you coming? Yeah, Echo goes. That was pretty cool. I'll go the whole time. I'm going to be digging my arm in the pouch and seeing if there's anything in there. I'll follow. It appears to be empty. <laughs> So you follow Anon for up a floor, over, up another floor, and then some ways, and then what feels like you go down three floors, and you come into a large room. This looks to be some type of warehouse, but near where you come in in the warehouse, there is a large table. It's been adorned with plates and food, silverware. Sitting at it are Miss Broom, Anon, sitting cross-legged, but they're so big that their chest still meets table height is some type of golem. There's a smaller table off to the side, and there's two things there you've never seen before. And they're sitting on what looks to be um, some sort of just crates. There is a extremely fair-skinned, blue-haired woman wearing a rapier and what looks to be, for most of you now, would be some type of nautical outfit. At the head of the table, beside the head of the table, there is a large naga adorned in gold, gold, large gold crown, um, hooked with different long golden chains, one pierced into the eye, or into the, the eye. this is my eye, into the, the pit of the nose, um, some going down and pierced into different scales, just blinged out, coiled very regally. At the head of the table is a massive tabaxi. This is by far, if you've met tabaxi before, this is, this is the chubby cat version of a tabaxi. Chunky boy. It's a chunky boy. They are adorned in finery. The ruffled neck piece, an ascot on top of that, large velvet suit with long tails sitting in a huge mahogany chair. You do notice that there are four seats that are empty. You hear a voice. Are you going to sit down? Or are you going to make me wait to eat? Is there like a coat rack? No, this looks like it's just they moved the table and furnishings into this warehouse. Okay, then he'll keep his robe on. I forgot he was wearing his robe. <laughs> Bathrobe. I'm talking to you. <clears throat> Are you going to sit? Are you going to make me wait long? I'm hungry. Or I'm going to sit. Totally you, sitting. You make don't have to ask Amulet twice. I'll make run into me, a chair. Make me a perception check. Eleven. Fourteen. Thirty twenty. Seventeen. So under fifteen, you can't tell where this voice is coming from because no one's moving their lips. Echo and charity, you happen to catch the emanation of the sound, and it's on the other side of this massive massive golem's head. And at that point you see. 
a black and white cat climb up and over and sits on the golem's head it's wearing a monocle and a tiny little coat i just was waiting for yeah. nate to write this stuff <laughs> Get on with it. I can't wait all day. I've got business to take care of. Amos gonna jump in the nearest chair and then ask for a cushion because she's likely not tall enough. The for The chairs table. Are all look like they were made so you can sit in them. Oh, score! Cool, even better. At the head of the table, the Dvaxi is watching you. When you all sit down, he says, "Marvelous! I'm so happy you've all made it." I'm excited beyond words to have you in my home as part of my family. Please, 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 please. My name is Tiberius Tawny, but you can call me Uncle. Hi, Uncle. Excellent. And you are, my boy, you are. Twig Swift Strike. Ah, Twig. Twig, you are a marvel, aren't you? I guess. Oh, don't guess, boy. Don't guess. You are. That's why you're here. That's why you're all here. I go, I go all sit in his chair. And he'll sort of. Lo- the cat looks at Akko and says, You smell like a wet dog. Yeah. 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 You, you hear the tabaxi, or you you see the tabaxi scold the cat. Says, "Professor, we've discussed this. We don't need your negativity at the dinner table." Good. Echo like futzes with the silverware, and he's like, he's like, salad fork on left. Yes, my boy, salad fork on the left. Everyone, move your salad forks to the left. You are my son. Who are you? Oh. Do you let him know that your name is Akko? Yeah. Okay. Cat's apologizing to me right now. <laughs> he, he says, marvelous. In all my years and all the children I've reared, I've <laughs> never reared an Otakin or a Noel. You're my first sons. Warms my heart. Young ladies, who might you be? If you're my uncle, don't you know me? Oh, but we are just meeting now. So you, I am your uncle by circumstance, your found parent. So I am introducing <sighs> myself and you are introducing yourself. We are exchanging names. Names have power. I give you mine freely. Just like my home. Just like your education. I'm I'm Amulet. You are a kinder, are you not? I am. I've never had a kinder in my household. I am greatly intrigued. I think you'll like me. I already do, Amulet. I already do. And you, young lady. There are so many cats. You you literally (laughs) ring with song. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Stormsong. It's a, it's a place. Well, it's, it's kind of complicated. It's a, it's a place. There's like a, it's a really long story. Ah, we have plenty of time for you to tell that story and so many more. I've never heard of your home. So you as well are a first. All of you first among, all of you so special. And your name? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Charity. Excellent. Twig, Akko, Amulet, and Charity, my sons and daughters. Welcome to the open house. I'm your uncle Tiberius Tawny. This is your sister. Sitting beside to his left is a 
light skinned, pale but with a tinge of blue, with long hair that almost matches the skin color. Like I said, wearing what looks to be some type of naval outfit. She almost looks slightly embarrassed by his flourish. And she kind of half waves and she's, uh, um, my name is Norhand. Um, I found you. Well, I didn't find you. I found the people that took you. And then I took you. Let's call it liberating. I mean, I don't want to make it sound creepy, but I, I saved you from that. Um, this is, where? Where find? She kind of looks like she's trying to figure out how to explain it. Spell wrong I've heard here. Heard of a place called the Sea. Yeah, Sea. Have you Fish. ever heard? Have you heard of a place called the Astral Sea? Mm. Oh. No, but I love boats. Well, that's good because I love boats as well, and I learned to love boats here. You then hear kind of a slight hissing, and you hear, can we get on with it? They're going to learn about all this once they start their instruction. The large naga and all of, of her finery begins speaking. I am Lady Morma. I will be your teacher. I am strict but fair. And I will give you opportunity. Nothing will be off limits in your learning endeavors. So let's save lessons, no hand, for another day. So Broom, Ms. Broom opens up Lady Morma's dish, and it's a slowly moving, living rat, but it's bigger than a normal rat, it's about the size of a cat. And she disgorges her jaw and snaps it up. That is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. You can see the tail wagging out of her mouth and she just smiles, this giant grin, and you can see the, her fangs hanging out. Miss Broom then puts the lid back on and goes around opening opening up everyone's food before going and sitting back down. Um, I like eating, but do I have to eat live stuff? She walks by and she says, "No, my child, you cannot." Okay, good. It's good, <sighs> fresh. Oh no, it's cold. So in front of the professor, there is a small dish, and in it can be some type of ground meat. The golem he sits on, Miss Broom takes the lid off, and there is a pile of mud. Norhand's dish is removed, and it looks to be some type of wild seafood. Uncle Tani's dish and it's, is moved, removed, and it's this massive feast of many different things. She moves over to Anon's dish undoes it and it is a steaming soup. She goes over to these two things that I'm pretty sure none of you ever have ever seen before. They look like a mixture of an insect and a crab. They're big, all probably about as big as Akko. They have four arms and a chitinous shell. There's one dish between them and she daintily moves it because then they both kind of smack each other around trying to get as much of it off there. And you hear Tawny, ha ha! Ah! And they both turn and lower their heads and decorum, gentlemen, decorum. That is Klaxon Vit. You'll learn that they are Mesoloth. They have chosen to live here rather than be employed by any side of what is known as the blood war. 
They will be your combat instructors. They are, have been with me for as long as either can remember. And they both kind of look at you with their huge green glowing eyes and a small bit of green vapor coming out of the side and they click their hands <coughs> together. And both, you assume it's a smile, turn and just start fighting for the food again. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Broom moves around. She, Twig, she removes the lid on your plate and it's covered in oysters. Um, smells as if they've been lightly cooked. Um, smells really, really good. Echo, she removes your lid on your platter and it is a haunch of slightly seared meat. You're not sure what kind of meat it is. You've never smelled this before, but it is tantalizing. Amulet, she comes over and reaches in and grabs an extra set of silverware, puts it on the table, <laughs> and opens your yours up. And it is a mixture of cubes of meat, and again, you're not sure what, um, that have been seared and then cut up in roasted potatoes, and there appears to be some type of thick, hearty gravy on top. <laughs> She's real excited. <laughs> yeah, full plate! There is already bread and salads on the, the, the table as well. Um, as well as these murky but very sweet smelling glasses of liquid. Charity, she pulls yours open and there is a, what looks probably to be some type of uh, flying animal that has been roasted whole, but it's a small flying animal, um, heavily seasoned. There are what looked to be some type of roasted root vegetable. And then in a small little, I don't know what you'd call it, it almost looks like a goblet, there is an egg. Um, and then Ms. Broom goes and sits down at her table and rings a tiny bell. And Uncle Tani looks around and says, my children, you bring me such mirth and joy. Please, 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 eat, eat, eat. Oh, uh, eats some of, some of the meat. And then he picks up his cocktail fork and snags one of Twig's oysters. <laughs> share. Share. You eat meat. Like, hold stuff. Just holds the large chunk of meat out. <laughs> good. All right. Twig will reluctantly take a bite. It's very good. It's rare, but that doesn't really bother you too much, Twig. Fresh. Um, it tastes different. It doesn't taste like normal game that either of you have eaten, but it's really good. You're not sure what it is, but it, it has a really good flavor. It's very well seasoned. Um, it's on that perfect end of rare to raw. Um, so yeah, it's very, very good. And did you say you took a drink as well? He'll, he'll have the drink, yeah. Um, so you lap up the drink. It is sweet as if it's some type of fruit that's been pulped. You feel like when you drink it, you feel very... Um, Robust, I guess, would be the word for it. You feel very good. Look, like it's very, it's not overly sweet, but it definitely hits a, a spot. Everyone else, anything else you'd like to say, do, or eat during this time period? Amulet's going to eat with two forks. And then eventually one fork will go away. But then towards the end, she'll remember what the scary guy said and put it back on the table. 
that you're going to be like, and eventually she's just eating with a knife, and then eventually <laughs> she's eating with a finger. <laughs> You'll see different utensils like disappear, and then eventually it'll be like that, like whole like oh scary guy said, oh put it back on the table. <laughs> uh, Charity, Charity's going to eat, and she will talk to like whoever is listening. Just, just the whole meal. You'll hear all about how she's real glad this is some kind of like, like fowl type bird and not fish because she like really has a problem eating fish and it's not anybody's fault. But like maybe if it's breaded, sometimes it's okay. But only from like this one place. Like she'll just, she just goes. Anon, who's sitting beside you, just puts his hand on yours and just taps it, and he leans. Or they lean in and they say, "It's wormling." The city is, they're, they're all over the place. They're a nuisance animal. This is awesome! You can write about it in your book. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of a verbal processor, you know? I mean, at least that's what I was told. I was told I was kind of a verbal processor. She's just going to, like, now she's just going to talk to him. It's just nonstop. <laughs> Do you talk while you're eating? Like, yeah, 100%. like you're just chewing. She, and... She's like, and so one time, Daddy, was... like, she'll just talk through like mouthfuls of food. Yeah, no, nonstop. She now here. You, that's this is now like her new friend. Yeah. So Anon looks at you and smiles. He says, "Charity, I cannot wait to introduce you to my job." We'll have so much fun together. In danger. <laughs> <laughs> um, so dinner goes and there's all you know chit chat around everything. Um, Uncle Tani is talking to Norhand about um different things that she's brought him and different arrangements for things that he would like her to take with her um do you know he inquires that does her crew um have accommodations she says yes i'm not gonna put you out um he mentions that um miss broom had to clean up after um boosh of Uth of shoot of shaw um and she's like, yeah, I get it, I get it, Uncle. It's you know, it's it's just what he leaves behind. It's not his fault. <laughs> um, that's why he wears the suit of armor. <laughs> um, believe me, we live together on a boat. I know how this works. Um, she asks about. Um, She asks about someone named Rylan. And things get kind of quiet on the other end of the table. And Uncle Tony goes, oh, well, we're, we're not on speaking terms currently. Um, he has decided to uh, throw his lot in. Um, and they, can you believe it, they put a precinct house on the end of Lonely Street right before the Gilded Gate. Um, and now he's there. I, I don't understand what they're doing. I think that they think I'm doing something wrong. So they're simply looking to further harass me. And I've lived here almost as long as the harmonium has been a thing. So I don't know what Rylan sees in that, but until he can um, remove himself from these bad influences, uh, he is not someone I'm concerned about right now. Uh, and you can tell that Norhand is not happy with that answer, but she just kind of puts her hands and she goes, you, you know, he can't and he won't do anything to you. He can't. None of us can. So I don't know what you're so concerned about. So, well, he, he, he kind of looks around and sees you listening. Goes, we don't discuss this in front of your siblings. This is quite adult talk. And she goes, okay, okay. Everyone kind of finishes doing what they're doing. Um, 
A couple times, Twig and Akko especially, you notice that the large golem turns and just looks at you. It has a face that's very rudimentary carved. Big spots for eyes, kind of a flattish nose, and a, what looks to be just like a straight line for a mouth. Um, you just will turn a look and then kind of go back to putting this mud substance in its mouth. I will definitely like, you know, like when like a cat will look at you and then, but you can tell that it's like a staring contest now and like you can't look away first or like you lose. Like who definitely does that. Yeah. Um, so you're staring and he, and it turns its head and it's not really, it seems like it's processing. And the well-dressed cat crawls over and then starts staring back at, staring back at you on its other shoulder and goes, what are you looking at? Mm-hmm. I think you think you're, that you're the alpha around here. Let me tell you something you're not. You're not. And if you keep staring at my friend, I'm going to come piss in your food. No. Unclean. Bad. Eyes. Eyes. Look. Down. Look. Dirt man. New. It, yeah, he is. He's my friend. I'll keep, I, I don't feel like Shan right now. Maybe my friend. Dirt man. Back on its haunches, sort of like sitting up. Use its little paws to straighten its little jacket. As if you want to go a few rounds, boy, I'll teach you. I'll teach you real good. And it reaches into its pocket with one of its paws and has a little wand. Why? Why fight? Be, be friend, dirt man. Nice. It's good. A large golem reaches down, scoops the professor up and puts him back on the other shoulder. You can hear him hiss a little bit and kind of paw at its head. Echo, remember this. (laughs) (laughs) Anon looks at you and looks at Professor Jiggly and then looks back at you and smiles. He says, believe me, we've, we've all got things we remember. You know, Echo, he wants trapped in my bag. And then he turns and looks, or they turn and look at the amulet and they say, that bag that you're holding. That <laughs> kitty need house train. Look, almost a year to have it cleaned. Well, at least it's cleaned. <laughs> so, do remember be civil. There's a time and a place for everything. Mm. It's then, they turn, then they turn and look over at Professor Jiggly again and go, you know, like the time and place where I cut all your whiskers off. Oh, snap! <laughs> Professor Jiggly again sits up on two legs and says, I don't have to be talked to like this. Jumps down and butt storms out of the room. Slowly, the golem gets up and, and slowly follows him out of the room. And you can all feel Uncle Tani's eyes on you slightly disapprovingly. Anon kicks back, puts their feet up on the table, puts their hands behind their head and says, he's not my uncle. <laughs> Why is he so cranky? Who's that? The professor. Well, I think if you escaped the doom of your world, saw everything and everyone you know perish, madness, and your crystal sphere become a husk, detached and floating into the blind eternities, you would probably find yourself slightly irritable, but I get the impression that he was a unrepentant prick before that. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, okay. That that makes sense. The whole conversation here, like with the cat, Charity's been suspiciously quiet. Um, she's been actually like doing something in the little book that he gave her with with the pen. And when 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 this conversation's over, she kind of like rips a page out and like folds it and she's like artfully tearing it into like a heart. And then she just kind of like nudges, nudges it on like this. He leans hey. down and says, you don't rip the pages out. No, no, it's it's fine. It's I made you a thing. Yeah, and all you have to do no, is No, you should block. take it. The, no. He, wait, wait, they'll wait, take wait. it. They'll take it, but <laughs> this is charity. All you have to or they say charity, all you have to do is draw it in the book and I will see it. You know, oh yeah, but I mean it's so there's a gift giving. Not, Thing. To tear up the magical tongue. Okay, I won't anymore now that I know. But like, you know, there's a gift giving component, and I feel like that's a like context is important. It's like just, just it's a thing. Just it's like I'm because you know it, it, we're friends, so I got to make sure that you understand that. Also, charity, this is a down payment for a job you're going to do for me. So, while it's a gift, it's also payment. So you don't have to give me anything in return. Cool, I know. I did it because I'm a nice person. You are a nice person. I, I know. Actually, I found all four of you to be delightful. But let's be quiet about this thing we're going to do because I don't know if your uncle would quite approve of it, but that's okay because <laughs> once you're successful, you won't care. She kind of, she like goes, okay, like really loud. Okay. <laughs> Everyone kind of turns and looks. Just, are they just keep put their hands behind their head and just like, hmm, mm hmm. <laughs> By the way, if they open it, it's like a, it's really crappily like torn heart, and it says you're the best, but your is misspelled. There. <laughs> About that time, when all the, everyone's turns and looks, you hear the loud noise, and you see, um, oh man, I lost track where I was at. You see, um clocks and vit tearing into a crate and popping open these bottles and they're sloppily chugging them into their maw and norhan gets up pulls out her sword and she's like get away from those those are not for you and uncle tani gets up and he stomps over he reaches into his coat pocket. He puts on a large white glove and he slaps both of them. And they both kind of put their heads down. He says, gentlemen, I think it's time for you to retire for the evening. They both get up and you see each of their extra arms grab an extra bottle, tuck it in against them. And they push their, both their way, fight through the doorway. You can hear them moving down through the hallway, pushing each other. Otani reaches down and pulls out a bottle and he says, oh, no hand, you've outdone yourself. Professor Berry wine, really? Oh, the good stuff. Mm. Children, you're in for a treat. Your sister has brought you something and, and brought your uncle something. Uh, Miss Broom, could you bring out the tiny glasses, please? So she brings out tiny glasses and he pops one of them open and pours just a little bit for each of them. I would like you all to make constitution checks. <laughs> checks are this saving is going to go great. Saving throws. Oh, all right. Oh, God. Mm. Oh, God. 14. Eight. Oh, nat oh. 20. Nice. <laughs> 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 <Nat 20. laughs> Yeah, there it is. I am back to rolling 19s. I got a 23. Charity and Amulet, you're like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing I've ever drank in my entire life. Now I feel like I'm bouncing off the walls. I can't believe how good this feels. This is great. I'm so amped. So Charity's just so like, like, even. Charity's like, this is, yeah. <laughs> She's like, good evening, gentlemen. This is oh, gosh. <laughs> I go, you're like, your, your eyes are just glazed over. You can taste sound and smell color. Uh, <laughs> the world is your oyster, literally, just like those oysters that were on Twig's plate. 
and now you're like eating the shells. Um, Twig, what'd you get? 14? 14, yeah. Yeah, you're like, sweet. Sweet. <laughs> sweet. Miss Broom looks disapprovingly as much as a robot can look at Uncle Tani for giving you this. But a snore hand, non giggles. Um, he says, well, or they say, or Taki says, well, this is a this is a special occasion. And she like playfully slaps his hand. Anon looks at them and says, Well, you know what? You've got business to discuss, Tony. I'll I'll see the children back to their room. Before we leave, I'm gonna scoop the rest of my meat into a roll and put it in one of my pants pockets. It's like a grandma at the old country buffet. She doesn't know where she's going to get her next meal. She's got to have snacks. <laughs> Road snacks. All right, Akko, make me another, maybe a wisdom saving throw. Hmm. It's, that's actually uh, 19. You really want to eat that pocket. But you're not I was sure. I was literally just gonna be like, but you're not sure you should. It's gonna take that sandwich. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you like, really want to eat that pocket. And it's like, like mm. the world is his oyster, and but not in front of everyone. That's an oyster sandwich. Yes. So, Anon starts to guide you back towards your wing of the house, which you're realizing as you're walking through this massive complex. It's really big. <laughs> um, and they take you a different route than they did before. Anon opens a room. And it's not big. There is a single, nice, upholstered, very uncomfortable chair in the middle of it. There is two corner hearths burning softly. And on each wall, there is a massive mirror. They look at you and they walk over and they say, gather around. Anon sits in the chair, makes themselves comfortable. You see, hooked on the chair is another bell. Anon looks at Charity and says, Charity? Yeah? Please ring the bell. Okay. So, yeah, so go ring the bell. You ring the bell, <clears throat> and the mirror goes from, the mirrors go from reflection to seeing another room. All three mirrors looking like a panoramic view of one room. And in it sits a very lovely woman in another chair that looks just like this one. She lazily opens her eyes and looks. She says, Oh, it's me, you again. And Alma says, No, no, no. I know we didn't part the last time of the best of terms. But I've brought you visitors, Angela. You can see this icy glare shot at Anon. And then she looks down at the four of you sitting on the floor. She gets up. She walks over to a duvet that's in the room. She grabs four pillows. Now she grabs five pillows. She walks up to the mirror with four of them. She closes her eyes, presses them to the glass, and the four pillows spill out into the floor in front of you. Children don't sit on dirty floors. So grab your chairs, grab your seats. Anon nods, his, nods their head. Echo goes and grabs his pillow and then he presses on the mirror. 
It's a mirror. <clears throat> Why no go? You the said pillar. pillow. It's a pillow. Bring echo. Floor. The center mirror sits across from you. She looks at you. She's got her hands, her head on her hands, and she's sitting cross legged. She says, because I am stuck here and you are stuck there. We're stuck. We're here. You are in the city of doors. We're I here. am in my own. We'll call it a maze. <coughs> Sometimes Children, when you, well, when you do something that the lady disagrees with, you find yourself paying a consequence. So Twig will go over, sit on a cushion. Anon crosses their legs, kind of has their hands intertwined. Those of you who have not gone and set yet can kind of see this resigned nod. Emily will go, but she won't sit. She'll lay on it and like her hands, like, like she's laying on the floor, like she's watching TV. Thirty She's sits. trying. So, Push the pillow through the mirror. <laughs> it's not working. Um, my geologist says that I can no longer go there and you cannot come here, nor would I wish you to. This is, she looks and she goes, do you know what jail is? Yeah. I am imprisoned here. This is my jail. Why? I engaged in an activity that upset the lady. And as you'll learn, you do not upset the lady. Okay, but who's the lady? Mm. In your city, the city of doors where you now live, there are no powers. You, you all came from other places, correct? I yeah. think so. Did you, where you came from, did you worship? Oh. Not me. I mean, some people do, but, but not me. No. You? You answer the lady, Otter. You, you answer. No. No. That's good. Believe it or not. So, gods are not allowed in the city. Everyone and everything else is allowed, but not God. In the city of doors, there is only one true power, and that is the Lady of Pain. Nigella makes kind of a strange hand symbol over her heart. None of you recognize. She says, it is my hope that you never meet the Lady. She sounds mean. The lady is not good. The lady is not evil. The lady just is. As for why, she looks past you and stares daggers at Anon. I attempted to break the rules. Some of it was on my own. Some of it 
was helping someone else. But only I was caught. So Are you honestly, a bad person? My mom and dad said only bad people go to jail. Do you think I'm a bad person? I don't I don't know you yet. Then I will tell you what. My name is Nigella. Hi Nigella, I'm Amulet. Amulet, it is nice to meet you. While you live in the open house, you can come visit me whenever you choose. Anon, <clears throat> make sure you know the way. You can judge and decide if I'm a bad person or if I'm a good person. How does that sound? Sounds good. I'm assuming the rest of you introduce yourselves as well. Mm. Yeah. Smiles. It's kind of a tight, not forced smile, but resigned smile. I hope you will come visit me as often as you wish. I do not see many visitors, nor do I hear many tales. It's been a long time since small feet pitter pattered across these floors. Since I've heard tales of other places, other people, other things. I would very much love to hear your stories, other people, other places, and other things. So the door is always open. You ring the bell. You sit upon your cushions. I will answer. You can talk. She smiles kind of a, a softer, a tired smile. She says, I think that's enough for tonight. It's very late. My guess is, and again, she looks up at Anon. You have something you need to do before you go to sleep. She gets up. Touches the mirror with her hand. And she says, Good night. The mirror goes back to being a mirror. That's cool. So cool, right? That was really cool. I know. Forgot. Kill all. Anon. That's weird. They have a small box in their hands now, and the door is open. I said, come on, children. The night is young, and we have something to do. Like what, brush our teeth? Not yet. Can we take the pillows, <laughs> or do they have to stay here? Uh, the pillows stay here, and they're like, these <sighs> are for your time here at my pillow. OK. What's in the box? Twig. Twig is it a twig? I can't wait to show you what's in the box. So anon, they walk you again kind of in a roundabout way, but you find yourself in the courtyard. You look and they open their arms and say, This is Lonely Street. Anon points up and you can see the buildings. The sky is warped. Buildings are pushing down. Wow. Where, where's the sky? It's, uh, it's just buildings. That's... This is Sigil. There is no sky. Where are the uh, stars? I, I need to lay down. The only stars are the lights above. How do you know where you're going then? You learn. Again, if you come and learn from me, I can teach you so much about all of this. But so can this broom. So can Lady Marma. All of us have things we can teach you, all of those things different. 
Do we have to pick? Of course not. It's important that you have a well-rounded education. I'm more of a finishing school. Anon steps up towards Worthy. Brick half wall is. And in turn, they lift all of you except for Akko up to sit on the half wall and look out. Anon looks. You can tell they're scanning. The street's a little dark. You can tell this is night for here. They lean over in a conspiratorial tone, uh, tone say, you see, right there, they point to two blocks down. There is a building that has a false front pushed out in the form of a steeple. On the, on the front of the steeple, made of cogs, is a mechanical heart. And on leans in and says, that, that is the Church of Moloch. Now, do you children know who Moloch is? No. No. Moloch is bad. Moloch one is a former prince of hell. Heir is a tabaxi who lives there. And they put names in the book. You know what that means? People signed the book and promised to worship Moloch. And Moloch grows strong. Do you think we want Moloch to grow strong, children? No, that, that sounds kind of bad. What do you think, Amy Light? Do you want Moloch to grow strong? I mean, not if he's a bad guy. He's a devil. Oh, then he's a bad guy. His pastor has made quite a living here in Sigil. Because Moloch demands the best to feed that mechanical heart in hopes of retaking his form and getting his place back in the hierarchy of hell. This, Anon reaches and pulls the slides to the top of the box, and there is a fine mesh glass case inside of it, making a nature check. That's real 20. Eight. Amulet? Four. I either get 19 or a four. Charity, what'd you get? Uh, that would be a nine. So Twig, Charity, and Amulet, you're like, between looking up, looking out, and then this box, your just brains are having a hard time computing. I'm also munching on my sandwich. <laughs> Take a bite, so, put it away. Take a bite, put it away. You look down and you see tiny rust monsters. They look like a swarm. These are a gift from Norhan's bow. He made sure I got this. And I'm going to make sure that Joke and the Church of Moloch get this as well. I think that's where you come in. Tonight, you're going to go down the street. You're going to 
get inside, and you're going to let these little guys play with them. And do you know how you're going to do that? Very carefully. Carefully, quietly. Won't that make us bad guys? Anon looks at you and he says, well, Amulet, do you think sometimes you have to do bad things to stop bad people from doing even worse things? Yeah, sometimes. This is one of those times. We want to remind Moloch that they're not welcome on Lonely Street. Okay. She's convinced. And Anon looks over to Akko and hands him the box. So once you're inside, find a place. There's some metal. Open the box. Drop these. And they're two gold coins. You look at them and they have a smiling, devilish face on them. This will keep them from coming for you because when Anon looks at your chain shirt, Akko, and says, You don't want these getting a hold of that. No. And then you, when you leave, come right back here. Agreed? Good. Okay. Sure. That will. Stop. Bad cat. Oh. <clears throat> oh, Akko. And he, or they, excuse me, reach up and kind of scratch underneath your jaw a little bit. Says, believe me, I'm going to show you how to get even with Professor Jigsaw. And that's where we're going to stop for tonight. <laughs> And two air horns, one session. I know. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> Big night. Solid start. So what I'd like everybody to do is go around, um, tell everyone where they can find you. Uh, if you have anything going on, um, yeah, just kind of let, let anyone who's watched you tonight um, be awesome. Tell them a little about yourself and where they can find you. Um, Twig, why don't you go first? All right. Well, you can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Cubicle Zombie. Uh, you can also find uh, myself and Warrior at DNDDT Podcast on Twitter. Sure. Uh, you can find me at Warrior MN on Twitter and Instagram. Um, probably several social media accounts I've forgotten about as well, but they're not getting updated. Not going to lie to you. Um, Additionally, uh, you can check out dnddg.com for the uh, podcast uh, Ringer mentioned, as well as uh, dndeets, which is a regular feature that follows episodes of both uh, the dnddg podcast and uh, now Down in Outlands, as well as formerly Domains of Dread, uh, tracking stats, various esoteric facts. It's a good time. Um, and as well, uh, Check out Teal Turn Radio like all this week. Lots of fun new stuff. The return of Dive Club on Friday. Uh, we're leading in uh, Clark Feldman's uh, Twitch stream. So that'll be a good time. And um, some surprises as well, I think. So stay tuned. And what else? Um, you can't find me anywhere. I'm only here. <laughs> Occasionally on Facebook, if you want a really good recipe. Um, yeah, that's it. Recipes and puns. Those are my go-to. <laughs> and Charity. I am at Smarky Betch with an E, not an I. You can find me on all the places, uh, mostly on Twitter and TikTok these days, because I'm too old for that platform, but here I freaking am anyway. Um, <laughs> you can also follow us uh at uh twitch.tv tv forward slash married marks where we're starting to do more gaming and dj streaming with my husband and all sorts of stuff so every sunday 
you want to catch some sick EDM. Uh, he, he usually does about an hour to three hour long stream of music every single Sunday. So, you know, music joy for your ear holes during COVID. So come check it out. Um, you can find me anywhere you can find Hill Term Radio stuff. Um, Beard and I did just start a new substitute podcast for Hill Term Radio um, called The Heels Guide to Survival. Um, where we're going to talk about everything about wrestling um, and just try to figure out like how to get through all this. Um, we'll have people on and we'll discuss kind of what everyone's doing um, and just have some nice, hopefully fun, frank conversation. Um, everybody in kind of that heel turn circle has worked really hard to get the Twitch stream and the YouTube page moving again with a lot of different things um, as warrior mentioned um, so you can expect this to be pretty busy there will be a lot of interesting things going on um, i want to definitely thank james uh, for uh just for being the co-conspirator for a lot of this um and taking the reins with a lot of other people to get the Twitch and YouTube going. Um, I want to thank Duke Walters for our music. Um, you can find Duke on TTRP theaters, different um, shows, as he's a big contributor and a kind of um, big wig there. But he did do all the music for Down Out Ones, which was awesome of him to do. Um, I'd like to thank casual Doug because if there is no Doug there is no show so um, as always you know Nick Karen and casual Doug are kind of the movers and shakers behind heel turn radio that make a lot of the visual audio run not just smoothly but better than it has any reason to be moving uh, I want to thank um, all four of you for sticking with this. Um, I want to thank um, um, I just want to um, thank family who aren't here. Um, I'm not super close to mine, but whenever you have a loss, it can be disconcerting. Um, and I apologize that I wasn't very on my game tonight, um, but I did lose my last grandparent yesterday. And um, that's been real weird. <laughs> so um, RIP Big Bud, wherever you're at, um, you lived a long one. So 96 years, going on 97. Beat cancer twice. Beat cancer twice, son. <laughs> Um, it's claim to fame. Just yeah, that's um, but that's about it. And again, I want to thank everyone for jumping on down that ones and being a part of this. I'm still looking for businesses on Lonely Street, so if you have a weird idea, um, hey, I gave you a good one. You did. If you have a weird idea and want to possibly see it pop up on the the show, just reach out and contact me. Um, You've already said you can't have heartbreak street on the heartbreak, heartbreak hotel yeah so so no one no one suggests that <laughs> without further ado i'd like to say thank you and we'll see you in two weeks bye bye bye